Today's presenter is Suzanne Stevens. She's the program manager for the expanded testing initiative of the Florida Department of Health. She also coordinates the Florida Caribbean AETC CDC testing initiative and medical case management training programs. And she also serves as a case management expert for the Florida Caribbean AETC Project ECHO program. Ms. Stevens has spent the last 10 years as a health services and facilities consultant with the Florida Department of Health, HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis section. Ms. Stevens provides technical assistance throughout the state of Florida as it relates to medical case management and core program eligibility requirements for individuals living with HIV, AIDS. Her vast experience also includes implementation of Medicaid and Medicare program changes, implementation of service contracts, and the development and rollout of statewide policies and procedures. Previously, she worked for 10 years as a director of client services for an aid service organization, and she has extensive experience in both providing and overseeing case management and direct client services. Without further ado, we now welcome Suzanne Stevens. Suzanne? Today we are going to present on, this webinar is going to be discussing housing and homelessness as it relates to the HIV and AIDS population. At the conclusion of this presentation, you should be able to define and explain homelessness, describe the impact of homelessness on the HIV population, identify the reasons for PLWHA homelessness, and identify potential housing resources. So the first thing that you need to know is the definition of homelessness as defined by the Housing and Urban Development, otherwise known as HUD. HUD has issued the final regulation to implement changes to the definition of homelessness contained in the Homeless Emergency Assistance and Rapid Transition to Housing Act. The definition affects who is eligible for various HUD-funded homeless assistance programs. The new definition includes four broad categories of homelessness. The first two are people who are living in places not meant for human habitation, emergency shelters, transition housing, or existing in institutions of establishment where they currently reside. The only significant change from the existing practice is that people will be considered homeless if they are exiting an institution where they resided up for 90 days, and that was previously 30 days, and were shelter or a place not meant for human habitation immediately prior to entering that institution. Also, people who are losing their primary nighttime residence within 14 days, which may include a motel or hotel, or a double-up living situation, and lack resources by supporting networks to remain in housing. HUD had previously allowed people who were being displaced within seven days to be considered homeless. The proposed regulation also describes specific documentation requirements in this category, and this is now going to be 14 days. Additionally, there is a new category of homelessness, and it applies to families with children or unaccompanied youth who have not had a lease or ownership interest in a housing unit in the last 60 days or more, have had two or more moves in the last 60 days, and who are likely to continue to be unstably housed because of disability or multiple barriers to employment. This category is similar to the current practice regarding people who are fleeing domestic violence. So now that you have an idea of what the definition of homeless is, we also need to discuss what chronic homelessness is, which is different. Under HUD, a chronically homeless individual is someone who has experienced homelessness for a year or longer, or who has experienced at least four episodes of homelessness in the last three years and has a disability. A family with an adult member who meets this description would also be considered chronically homeless. Chronically homeless people are among the most vulnerable populations. They tend to have the highest rates of behavioral health problems, including severe mental illness and substance abuse disorders, conditions that may exacerbate physical illness, injury, or trauma. And consequently, they are frequent users of emergency room services, crisis response, and public health safety systems. They account for 16% of the entire homeless population. So in order to discuss homelessness, we need to discuss the link between poverty and homelessness. Difficult choices must be made when limited resources cover only some of these necessities. It's often housing, which absorbs a high portion of income that must be dr dropped. If you are poor, you're essentially an illness, an accident, or a paycheck away from living on the streets. Individuals or families are poor if their annual pre-tax cash income falls below the dollar amount or poverty threshold 
that's set by the Census Bureau using a federal measure of poverty that is recalculated each year. The U.S. Census Bureau determines poverty status by comparing pre-tax cash income against the threshold that is set at three times the cost of a minimum food diet set in 1963. Family is defined as persons living together who are related either by blood or marriage. In this case, homeless and poverty are inextricably linked. Poor people are frequently unable to pay for housing, food, child care, health care, and education. Two factors that are accounting for an increase in poverty are the eroding employment opportunities and a large segment of people that are out of the workforce, or they're in the workforce but they're being underpaid and not able to use the money that they get to afford housing, and the declining value and availability of public assistance. In 2012, the official national poverty rate was 15%, and there were 46.5 million people listed in poverty. So living in poverty right now, between 2010 and 2012, in the United States, it's calculated at 15.1%. Florida, as you can see based on this slide, is higher at 15.5%, and the U.S. Virgin Islands is even significantly higher at 21%. The median income is a three-year average from 2010 to 13 and can be found at the Census Bureau in the link provided. For Florida, during the three-year period, the median income was 47,114. 38 states have higher income than Florida. And the U.S. Virgin Islands 2009 median income, which is the most recent that we have, was 37,254. Unemployment rates are something else that we need to look at when it comes to homelessness. In December of 2013, the United States had a 6.7% unemployment rate. Florida had a slightly less one with 6.3%, and the U.S. Virgin Islands had a very large one at 13.5%, significantly higher than the average of the states or Florida. So why are people homeless? According to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, an estimated 12 million households now pay more than 50% of their annual income for housing, and a family with a full-time worker earning minimum wage cannot afford the local fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment anywhere in the United States. So as you can tell, in order to be able to pay for housing, you must be making more than the minimum wage. So even if you have a job and you're making minimum wage, you are more likely not able to have stable housing. And additionally, HUD also notes that the generally accepted definition of affordable housing is no more than 30% of the monthly income going towards housing costs. Families paying more are considered cost burdened and can have difficulty affording food, clothing, transportation, and medical care. The lack of affordable housing is a significant hardship for low-income households and can prevent them from meeting other basic needs, such as nutrition, health care, or savings for the future. According to the National Alliance to End Homelessness, as of last official count, about 610,042 people experienced homelessness on any given night. Keep in mind the definition of homelessness and chronic homelessness. There were 222,197 families, 387,845 individuals. Of that, 18% are considered chronically homeless. And remember, chronically homeless is different from the definition of regular homelessness in that they can be transient and moving within the 60-day period. And then of all the homeless people, 9% are veterans. The approximate population for the Virgin Islands is 105,000. So the total number of homeless for 2014, they've identified 104 people in shelters and 363 not sheltered meaning that they're living in parks or other places where there is not a roof over their head. When we talk about homelessness, we need to talk about the youth. Youth are homeless for a variety of reasons, but the primary reason given is family conflict. For this reason, communities should focus their youth work on family interventions. Family interventions consist of several strategies, such as reunification, family finding, family connecting, or even aftercare services. For a small subset of youth who cannot return home, long-term housing interventions will be needed. And in the HIV world, we do serve a lot more youth, and a lot of them are considered homeless due to conflicts regarding their HIV. 
Another thing to discuss is veterans. Veterans often become homeless due to war-related disabilities. For a variety of reasons, physical disabilities, mental anguish, PTSD, and other issues, many veterans find readjusting to civilian life difficult. Difficulty adjusting can give rise to dangerous behaviors, including addiction, abuse, and violence, which coupled with difficulties can lead to homelessness. Prevention measures, including job placement services, medical services, and other such services can assist in mitigating homelessness. And again, in the HIV population, we tend to serve a large number of veterans, so they will have multiple issues. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between rural versus urban. In the state of Florida, we have seven major urban areas, and that would be Miami, Broward, Palm Beach, Orlando, Jacksonville, Tampa, and then some of the other counties in between. The rural counties are primarily the panhandle and the middle of the state that runs through Alachua County. So in the urban areas, 29 for every 10,000 are homeless. And mostly urban, the rate is 19 per 10,000. The lack of services have been moving to the urban areas. In the rural areas, it's 14 people per 10,000. There are two rural areas in the U.S. actually have the highest rates in the entire country. Rural rates vary widely because individuals may stay with family or friends rather than in shelters, and they would still be considered chronically homeless. So just because you're in an urban area doesn't mean that you have access to more services. It doesn't mean that there's going to be more shelters available. As a matter of fact, in many of the urban areas, shelters are not necessarily available due to the number of people and the lack of resources in that community for homeless. Let's talk a little bit about cash assistance. The declining value and availability of public assistance is another source of increasing poverty and homelessness. People with disabilities, too, must struggle to obtain and maintain stable housing. Until its repeal in August 1996, the largest cash assistance program for poor families was what used to be called Aid to Families with Dependent Children, and is now referred to with a different name. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996, which was the federal welfare reform law, repealed the AFDC program and replaced it with what we now call TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. So in 2005, Canis helped a third of the children that AFDC helped and reached above the 50% poverty line. Unfortunately, TANF has not been able to keep up with inflation. In 2006 to 2008, TANF caseloads has continued to decline, while food stamp caseloads have increased. So let's consider the factors involved with those who are HIV and homeless and the issues surrounding this. The costs of health care and medications for people living with HIV are often too high for people to keep up with. The person living with HIV AIDS is in danger of losing their jobs due to discrimination or as a result of frequent health-related absences. While they may have sick leave or the ability to take time off due to the number of absences and the frequency, they are often held accountable under different standards. As a result, up to 50% of PLWH in the United States are at risk of becoming homeless. Conditions of homelessness may increase the risk of contracting HIV. A disproportionately large number of homeless people suffer from substance abuse disorders, and that can be alcohol or injecting drug use. Many homeless people inject intravenously and may share or reuse needles. As you are aware, in the state of Florida, we do not have a needle exchange program, although that is something that has been brought to the legislature's attention and will continue to be pushed. Conditions of homelessness may lead to sexual behaviors that include contracting HIV as well. If you're homeless, you're going to do what you need to to get money to feed yourself, maybe stay in a place overnight. So you're more likely to practice unsafe sex and not use condoms and spread HIV or contract HIV. Homeless people with HIV AIDS encounter many challenges due to their health. Factors such as poor hygiene, malnutrition, and exposure to cold or rainy weather. Homeless people are already three to six times more likely than housed people to become ill. 
since HIV targets the immune system, PDL, WHA do not have the ability to fight off disease, and their risk of illness is even higher. Additionally, challenges include crowded shelters with poor ventilation and can endanger people with HIV AIDS by exposing them to infections such as hepatitis A, C, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and skin infections. One study shows that people who sleep in a shelter are twice as likely to have tuberculosis if they are HIV positive. Psychological factors also play an additional role in the progression of HIV and AIDS. Psychological distress has been shown to increase the severity of the disease. For example, depression decreases a person's likelihood to adhere to medication, which is necessary for the treatment of HIV and AIDS. It is difficult for homeless PDL WHA to adequately treat their disease. For example, homelessness makes it more difficult to obtain antiretroviral treatment, the medication for HIV. Antiretroviral treatments have complex regimens, and adherence is very difficult for people who don't have access to stable housing, clean water, bathrooms, refrigeration, and food. Many homeless people also do not have health insurance and cannot pay for their medications and have health services that are necessary to treat HIV AIDS, or they're not aware of services such as Ryan White and ADAP, which can assist with HIV treatment. Even if they are aware, many people are not going to want to pick up their health, their medication bottles, even if they can access ADAP, because they have no place to put them, or they don't want to take them with them to a shelter where people might find out that they have HIV, they might be beat up on or ridiculed. They also might need to refrigerate their medication or have food with their medication. And if you can't do that because you're homeless, then you're less likely to pick up your medications, even if you have access to them and then continue to take them. And we all know that adherence to medication is one of the keys in order to remain healthy and to treat HIV. The United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, otherwise known as HUD, addresses the problem with the program called Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS Program. But this program only serves 79 cities and 38 states. So more funding needs to be allocated to provide supportive housing to PLWH. The experience of homelessness exacerbates the disease of HIV and hinders treatment. And it increases the likelihood that the patient will not take their medications, will increase their viral load, and will spread the disease through unprotected sex. A few issues with shelters is that they minimally address the needs of the HIV AIDS. They actually minimally address the needs of anybody that is living in the shelter. A few education programs, such as sex games and videotapes, have been effective in shelters. Programs such as these need to become federally funded and widespread. Sex and drug use are strictly forbidden at most shelters, so many shelters do not allow outside HIV AIDS education and prevention programs to openly discuss these topics or to distribute condoms. This is a culture shift that we need to address among the homeless population and the providers of services so that we can get into these communities to provide education, condoms, and other information. When agencies are working with a homeless population, they should take into consideration their service delivery design. And what we mean by this is many organizations are open 8 to 5, whether you're a community-based organization providing case management, housing needs, or food, or whether you're a medical practice or clinic that you're seeing the patient. Because the person is homeless, you need to consider a flexible service system. The homeless might need walk-in appointments where they can come in without a scheduled appointment since it's hard to reach them or they have a hard time contacting people. You might want to consider outreach services where case managers or others go out and find homeless people and help them try to get into the system of care. And then also identify barriers along the cascade that impede. So it's not just the homelessness, but are there domestic violence issues? Are there children involved? What other issues are preventing this person from being stably housed? You also want to consider an integrated and interdisciplinary model of care. So you want to coordinate services across the multidisciplinary system. Arrange patient appointments rather than a passive referral and facilitate ability for self-management. 
We often will consider the homeless along with the other populations as people that need to fend for themselves or be self-reliant. And yes, while that is what we want, most homeless need a little bit more guidance on the front end. So if you're going to see a patient, you might actually pick up the phone as the case manager, make the call to the doctor's office, schedule the appointment, provide the bus pass, follow up to see that the patient showed up, and move through the system with the patient because of their identified special needs. Access to mainstream healthcare systems can be difficult. You want to network in your community, and this goes back to working with your homeless shelters and other service organizations to understand what service needs an HIV person has and how they can move through the system with the help of other providers. Assisting with transportation is a critical factor. Maybe even going so far as to accompanying the patient to the appointment and helping the provider understand the issues that that patient is going through, which may impact their treatment or what the doctor decides to do in terms of providing a treatment regimen. Also, if you have a peer program, you might want to consider using peers to help with retention and care. Additionally, you might want to look at your outreach if you have outreach workers in order to find the hard to reach or the lost to care, and for testing and treatment at outreach sites. If you work with a clinic, whether you are in a clinic setting or you are working with a private doctor on the outside, please remember to listen to the patient in a non-judgmental way. We need to make sure that we understand that while HIV is a critical issue, their issues of being homeless, maybe not having food, are things that they need to address before they'll even consider addressing their HIV. Try to understand what their issues and challenges are and use a patient-centered and intensive case management approach. Build mutual trust with that patient and promote retention and confidentiality. And use regular team meetings to provide support. And that may be team meetings within your organization or it may be interdisciplinary meetings where you are talking with the doctor, the nurse, a therapist, other organizations that are involved in this person's care. According to HUD, in recent years, the shortages of affordable housing are most severe for units affordable to renters with ex extremely low income. The federal support for low income rates has fallen 49% from 1980 to 2003. About 200,000 rental housing units are destroyed annually. Renting is one of the most viable options for low-income people. These phenomena, in turn, have only forced many people to become homeless. They have put a large and growing number of people at risk of becoming homeless. However, the demand for assisted housing clearly exceeds the supply. Only about one-third of poor renter households receive a housing subsidy from the federal, state, or local government. The limited level of housing assistance means that most poor families and individuals seeking housing assistance are placed on long-term wait lists. So the average wait list for Section 8 housing right now is 35 months. In the survey of 24 cities, people remain homeless on an average of seven months, and 87% of cities reported that the length of time people are homeless has increased in recent years. Longer stays in homeless shelters result in less shelter space available for other homeless who must find shelter elsewhere or live on the streets, park benches, and places like that. In 2007, it was found that the average stay in a homeless shelter for households with children was 5.7 months, while this number is only slightly smaller for singles and unaccompanied at 4.7 months. Thus, federal housing policy has not responded to the needs of low-income households while disproportionately, and so there continues to be an excessive waiting list for affordable housing. Other factors to consider, for families and individuals struggling to pay rent, a serious illness or disability can start a downward spiral into homelessness. First, you could lose your job, which many of us know happened to people several years ago when the economy took a dive depletion of your savings to pay for care, and eventual eviction. Most of us don't even have a savings account, and or if we do, it's so minimal, it wouldn't do anything to sustain us. One in three Americans, or 86.7 million are people, are uninsured. And of those uninsured, 30.7 are under the age of 18. Now, we know that with the Affordable Care Act, that may change, but that's going to take time. 
because we have to go through a process of enrollment, and not everybody will qualify for the Affordable Care Act. Battered women who live in poverty are often forced to choose between abusive relationships and homelessness as well. In addition, 50% of the cities surveyed in a survey conducted by the U.S. Conference of Mayors identified domestic violence as a primary cause of homelessness. Approximately 63% of homeless women have experienced domestic violence in their life. The relationship between addiction and homelessness is complex and controversial. While rates of alcohol and drug abuse are disproportionately high among the homeless population, the increase in homeless over the past two decades cannot be explained by addiction alone. Many people who are addicted to alcohol and drugs never become homeless, but people who are poor and addicted are clearly at increased risk of homelessness. So we've discussed homelessness, what it means, the definition, chronically homelessness, poor, youth, and veterans. Now that you've identified the homeless, and I know a lot of you work with a very extensive homeless population, so what is it that we can do to help the homeless? The Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS program is funded through a grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, also known as HUD. It provides states and designated eligible metropolitan areas with resources and incentives for meeting the housing needs of persons with HIV and AIDS. HUD directly funds metropolitan areas through what we call City Hopwa. And you will see a map regarding that in just a few minutes. The Florida Department of Health, which contracts with project sponsors, which are agencies and organizations at the local level, administers the State Hopwa program. And you will also see a map about that in just a few moments. Hopwa provides housing assistance with related supportive services for low-income persons with HIV AIDS and their families. Since the beginning of the hospital program in 1992, the federal government has made available $2.3 billion in HOPWA funds to support community efforts in housing initiatives. HOPWA is a needs-based program. Needs-based meaning that it is not an entitlement program where people can come and request assistance for housing and expect HOPWA to pay for their housing on a monthly basis. This is a challenge for the state of Florida and for the case managers who work with the clients because most of the clients, that, many of the clients that we serve live below poverty level and their monthly income is not enough to sustain their housing. Under what we call strong or short-term rent, mortgage, and utilities, this is designed to support households who currently have a living situation. It is required that projects assess whether the housing is safe decent and sanitary as part of their required ongoing assessment. This is not meant to serve people who are currently homeless and the need to look for housing, but instead to prevent homelessness for those who are already housed and may find themselves being on the edge of becoming homeless because they can't maintain their monthly rent for whatever reason. So this helps to stabilize clients who are already housed and to develop a permanent housing plan for long-term support in order to keep them in their situation. The strong new payments may not be used to relieve the household's responsibility to pay rent, mortgage, or utilities. It is strictly meant to assist people to prevent homelessness due to an unforeseen circumstance. As a short-term intervention tool, strong new assistance is not intended to provide continuous or perpetual assistance. And we all know that we tend to do that with our clients because of the situations that they are in. Strumio assistance should be consistent with, the, with an assessment of the family's housing or utility needs and connected to the establishment of a related individual housing plan. And these need to be addressed and assessed for their ongoing needs. Strumio payments are used to prevent homelessness and help them remain in their own dwelling. The goal of Strumu Assistance Under is to provide short-term interventions that help maintain stable living environments for households who are experiencing a financial crisis as a result of issues that arise from their HIV condition or other issues. Strumu Assistance is a type of prevention that is intended to reduce the risk of homelessness and along with other efforts to improve access to health care and needed support. The criteria states that you can receive up to 21 weeks of available assistance in a 12-month period. 
and that is for rent or a mortgage payment or a utility payment. StrongU does not cover first month's rent or a security deposit. So why is it that it doesn't cover that? Because StrongU is meant for people that are stably, are already in housing and not for those that are homeless. Tenant-based rental assistance provides long-term housing to those persons who are already in housing but might need more than five assists or less. TBRA is a subsidy for those who are needing long-term assistance and operates a lot like the Section 8 housing. It can not exceed past two years, and then it's supposed to transition clients into Section 8 housing. Again, as stated earlier, Section 8 housing often has a long-term wait list, and this can be a problem. Also, under the state of Florida Department of Health contracts, TIBRA is not currently an option. However, that will be changing in July of 2015 with the new contracts, where TIBRA will be allowed to be considered in your area. This is a map of the state hospital project sponsors in the state of Florida. And this is the ones that are funded by the Florida Department of Health. If you will see the white areas that are whited out, those are the city ones. And the city map is this one. And these are funded directly from HUD to the areas and do not go through the state of Florida. And they generally have their own guidelines. Most of them provide both StromU and TIBRA, whereas the state of Florida only provides StromU at this point. But again, that will be changing in July of 2015. Income limits for 2014, just to give you an idea, the low, uh, in order to qualify, you need to have 80% of the median income for one, two, and three persons that is listed here. So hospital funded housing is an effective platform for linking PLWH PLWH to care and improving health outcome. HOPL also promotes cross-collaboration with programs in HUD, such as the support for HUD's Office of Policy Development Research and Activities. Research continues to demonstrate that housing stability significantly increases HIV-positive clients' entry into retention and care and increases their adherence to complex HIV treatment regimens, resulting in improved health outcomes as well as reduced HIV transmission. Homeless persons with HIV and AIDS experience increased morbidity and mortality, more hospitalizations, decreased adherence to antiretroviral treatments as compared to those who are stably housed. In order to assist a client with housing needs, you must develop a housing plan. Tools for case managers and clients to outline and manage housing supportive services needs and goals to achieve housing stability. It helps HOPWA clients to achieve long-term independence and not rely on HOPWA. The housing plan needs to address specific situations, such as the need, the emergency situation that has arisen, the action steps that are going to be taken to address it. You cannot receive or offer somebody assistance if at the end of that five months, they are going to still be in the same situation that they are when they ask for assistance to begin with. There has to be a resolution at the end of that time period. Other things to consider when determining the plan is identifying eligibility for other housing assistance. Please don't just rely on StrongView or TIBRA when it's available, because that is not enough to meet most of our population's homeless needs. Identify supportive services to help them maintain stable housing and eligibility for mainstream assistance. Create a framework for addressing conditions. Again, that goes back to why is the person homeless or about to be homeless. It might need to be that they learn how to budget better, that they get a roommate, that they find alternative housing that's not as expensive. Any of these issues can be considered. You have to consider other funding. It can't be all about hospital. This might be other housing by HUD or local resources, such as the Salvation Army, Shelters, United Way. And you should participate in your housing continuum. Every area has a housing network that can show you other housing in the area. Here are some other resources for affordable housing. HOME, which is Home Investment Partnership, the Housing Trust Fund, the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, and you can see the rest of them. What you really need to consider if you would go to this link is that you might need to consider, much like Monroe County does in the state of Florida, 
in terms of building facilities, renting facilities, rehabbing facilities that might be about to go under, and putting people in long-term housing based on funding for these. These are grants that you should apply for. You should not, again, I'm going to repeat, you should not rely on HOPWA in order to maintain the need. You need to look at applying for grants for other housing needs within your community. Florida has an annual action plan, and under it there are these four different things that you can read, economic development, commercial revitalization, housing rehab, and neighborhood revitalization. And also it's important to become part of your homeless continuum and your homeless coalition to find other resources and to work with other agencies. So in summary, housing is a critical issue, especially for the HIV population. Stable housing means better increased health outcomes, which is what we want for our population, especially considering the complex medication treatments that they have to take. HOPWA is a start, but it is not the solution. And we have tended to use HOPWA as a solution in this state and wanting it to continue to provide ongoing assistance. You need to consider other housing. You need to look at your continuum. You need to consider applying for other grants. You need to know your other local agencies and the resources and how you might work with them to apply for grants together and get involved in your local housing coalition. Here are some of the references that you can go to. And that ends this presentation for today. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center's mission is to ensure that physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, dentists, pharmacists, case managers, and other healthcare professionals in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands receive state-of-the-art information, training, and consultation on the prevention, chronic disease management, and treatment of HIV and AIDS. Funding is provided by the HIV AIDS Bureau of the Health Resources Services Administration U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides a variety of HIV AIDS education, training, consultation, and resources. Visit our website, www.fcaetc.org, to learn more. Stay in touch with us by joining our mailing and email list. You will receive notices about upcoming educational opportunities, as well as new and updated HIV AIDS resources. You may also sign up to receive our HIV CareLink newsletter. Visit our website, fcaetc.org, and click on Join Our Mailing and Email List at the top of the homepage. Be sure to also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. The Florida Caribbean AETC provides consultation services to clinicians in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. If you have questions related to the content of this program or would like consultation on the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of HIV AIDS and related conditions, we would love to hear from you. We also offer consultation on the interpretation of resistance test results. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash consultation to ask your question today. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides pocket-sized treatment guideline resources that detail the federally approved HIV AIDS medical practice guidelines such as the adult antiretroviral therapy, hepatitis, pediatric antiretroviral therapy, adult opportunistic infections, tuberculosis, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, and occupational PEP. In addition, we have summarized common practices for the post-exposure prophylaxis in pediatrics adolescents. We have also developed resources that provide an overview for treatment of sexually transmitted diseases in HIV-infected patients and therapeutic agents for oral manifestations. Visit our website to download or request copies of these resources.
The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides web-based educational opportunities to increase the knowledge and skills of HIV healthcare providers. Live and on-demand options are available. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash education for more information. Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center, Project ECHO, provides a web-based didactic presentation on a current HIV treatment issue based upon current Department of Health and Human Services and other accepted treatment guidelines. Project ECHO also provides an opportunity to discuss case presentations submitted by participants and an opportunity to network with both your peers and HIV experts. All members of care and treatment teams, including case managers, are welcome to participate. Information discussed is targeted at providers with basic or intermediate HIV AIDS treatment experience. Choose from four session types. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash echo to view upcoming sessions and to register. If you're located outside of our region, the Clinician Consultation Center provides consultation services via the phone numbers listed here. Or you may also visit www.nccc.ucsf.edu for more information. To locate the AETC in your region, visit www.aidsetc.org.